Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to have Henry Bradford with us uh, from Cambridge, and uh, he's going to tell us about equations with constants in some hyperbolic and linear groups. Thank you, Yesh. It's a, always a huge pleasure to have the opportunity to come to Vienna. Uh, so this is all joint work with uh, Jakob Schneider and Andreas Thorm, both of whom are from the Technische Universität in Dresden. Uh, unfortunately, we yet to find a collaborator whose surname begins with the letter E. Then we'd only prove the best theorems, which is what we all want to do as mathematicians. Um, the, the results I'm going to talk about today really grew out of a project that was all about finite groups. And then we just noticed quite late in the day that there was this rather cute application that has a slightly more geometric flavor. Um, so if G is a group, and I take a preferred generator for Z, which I'll think of as a variable, um, then a non-trivial element of the free product, my group G with Z, so thinking of this as some kind of word in the variable X with some element of G, uh, this is called a mixed identity for G. If whenever I take an element of the group G and evaluate my variable X at the element G, I get the identity in G. And when I say evaluate, I mean, right, this free product, there is a, a unique homomorphism sending the generator X of Z to this element G and acting as the identity on G. Um, that's what I mean by evaluation. So something that is trivial identically under G when I view it as a function. And I'll say that the group G is uh, mixed identity free or MIF for short, if there exists no uh, mixed identities. G. Being MIF is a really restrictive property, group theoretically. For example, if your MIF, all of your normal subgroups have to be MIF2, or your non trivial ones, and um, if you decompose as non trivial direct products, you can't be MAF either. So this is quite a powerful property. Um, the examples, Gilbert Baumslag, in the 60s, showed that non-abelian free groups are MAF. Uh, this was later generalized to all uh, torsion-free, non-elementary Gromov hyperbolic groups. Um, the history of that generalization, to me at least, is this a little bit obscure. It was. It certainly appears in the work of Amaglobelli and Remus Lenikov in 2000. Um, but there's a sort of trail of papers going back from there that um, I eventually lose. Um, so I'm not sure um, what, what the prehistory of this result is exactly, but it was certainly known then. And then it was generalized further um, in 2016 by Hull and Ozin to all acylindrically hyperbolic groups with um, a trivial finite kernel, finite radical. Okay, henceforth, um, G is going to be MIF and finally generated by a set S. And I'm sort of going to be interested in um, quantitative aspects of MIF in terms of the word growth function. So if G is MIF and I take a word W in the free product, there is a non-solution to that word equation. So some element at which it's not trivial. Therefore, there's a shortest such uh, non-solution. And I'll call that the the length of that uh, shortest non-solution, the complexity of the word. So the complexity, which I write as uh, chi of W, depending on S, is the minimal uh, word length in G with respect to the generating set S of an element uh, at which you don't have the identity. 
and then I can define the uh, the MIF growth function early M G of S. This takes as input a positive integer n and outputs the maximal complexity among all elements of the free product of length at most n with respect to the obvious generating set. So this function is you know, some asymptotic invariant that measures how hard it is to find non-solutions to word equations. Um, so maybe if this um, function grows very fast, you have to look a long, long way for certain words to find a non-solution. I don't know, maybe that would be the good basis for some cryptographic protocol, as in um, this all yesterday morning. Um, so I introduced this and didn't know very much about it, but one thing that was quite easy to prove uh, is that for any finitely generated group G, there's a sort of universal uh, bound on the rate of growth of this. This grows at least uh, proportional to log of N. Uh, and this is a very elementary commutator argument. It's not much different than the fact that if you want a polynomial to vanish at your favorite N complex numbers, you can achieve that with something of degree no greater than N. Um, it's sort of a groupy version of that. Um, so given this proposition, it seems reasonable to call a group G uh, sharply MIF uh, if, um, if this is sharp, if the growth is essentially logarithmic. Um, so um, that was about as much as I knew in 2021, together with the fact that um, you know you can sort of take this easy argument of bound slug and try and make it effective, and you come up with some kind of bound of the form uh, n log n. I tried to do the same thing for more general hyperbolic groups and failed. Um, but now I can give you some examples of sharply MIF groups, and then I'll say what they are, and then I'll finish. So the new result following groups are uh, sharply MIF. Um, so first, the fundamental group of any closed orientable hyperbolic surface or three manifold. There are some hyperbolic groups. And second, in a slightly different direction, uh, PSLD Z for every D, at least two. Um, so some groups with a rather different flavor from the point of group view of geometric group theory. Um, with respect to this, I think it's not unreasonable to conjecture that every torsion-free non-elementary uh, Gromov of hyperbolic group uh, should be sharply MIF. Uh, that seems not implausible, but um, in both of these results, we're really using sort of finite index su subgroup structure in an important way. So one would need a very different argument uh, for, that, uh, for that more general setting. All right, that'll do, thank you.